here. Oh. I was a military brat, uh, and my father was a colonel in the Marine Corps. My father brought me back a camera from Japan. I think it was a Minolta, and I just uh, loved taking pictures for the high school newspaper or for the, the annual and, and whatever, and just you know all the kids in the neighborhood. Then, when I was graduating from high school, I was accepted to University of North Carolina, to Duke, all beautiful schools, and then somehow I got accepted into UCLA. Oh, because it had a theater art school, and it had an art school, had a photography school, and a film school. I thought, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> My father said, I'll, I'll, I'll give you extra money to go to UCLA, but only if you study business administration. <laughs> Economics 1A and accounting. I couldn't stay awake in those classes, so quietly I changed my majors to theater arts. He didn't find out about that until my second year at college when my counselor told him. He, he went apeshit and I thought he was going to just pull me out of college, but he let me stay and it was wonderful. Yeah, 17 years old. Scared. Scared. UCLA is a huge school with 45,000 students there. I came from school with 800 students in it. I was terrified. Sink or swim. But at UCLA, I, I got to study photography with Robert Heineken, a great, great photographer and a great teacher. I, I learned a lot. I learned dark room and I learned about my conceptual, about how to focus my images, uh, how to think about what I was going to shoot. And um, yeah, that was really good. And we had teachers then. Jean Ren Renoir was our teacher for a couple of months at UCLA. And Jimmy Wong Howe, the cameraman, and Haskell Wexler. I'd charge $100 or $125 for headshots. And there were all lots of young actors and musicians there. And a lot of the people became famous television movie, movie actors. And I got things happening. And Ray Bradbury hired me to do a book jacket for him. Then Rod McEwen saw Ray Bradbury said, hired me to do his book jacket. So it snowballed, snowballed, and kept getting bigger and bigger. And some of the uh, great PR people in Hollywood at that time loved my work. And I was pretty cheap, and it was really cute. <laughs> so that didn't hurt. The second year of school at UCLA, a young acting student who was very pleasant and looking and very nice and invited me to go down to Malibu and, and stay with him at uh, his uh, apartment. Uh-oh, I know what this means. And I was so ready, I was so ready. It was wonderful, it was great, yeah. And of course, I met John on my fourth year. I was close to graduating from UCLA. And uh, how did I meet John Schlesinger? Well, I was sent on a blind date to go to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel by a TV actress, a Broadway actress called Kay Ballard, who's a friend of John's. Said, would you, John's lonely, wants to be a friend to show him around LA, he doesn't know anyone. Can you do it? Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I love his movies. And, um, and that afternoon I read in Time Magazine, an article, an interview with him, said it's often me curious and difficult. And I thought, oh shit, he's gonna be a nightmare. Uh, so I called up a friend of mine, an actor friend. Can you go with me to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel? One kick under the tail means we're both gonna get out of here. Two kicks mean you get out of here. And it was two kicks. I, he was so sweet, bright, brilliant, charming, funny, uh, and just, uh, Dear, dear to my heart, and it's just, yeah, that's, I knew, you know, we had th three more dates after that, and I just felt, oh my God, there's something happening here in my heart, in my heart. Would you like to come to work on a movie, uh, Midnight Cowboy? I'm, I'm going to start in uh, four, four or five months in New York. I said, oh God, should I graduate or should I go work on Midnight Cowboy? Well, yes, work on Midnight Cowboy. Of course, I didn't know it was going to win four Oscars and uh, make a hundred million dollars and change my life. And, and it was really an important movie. The winner is John Schlesinger. It was pr pretty out there, an X-rated film. The only X-rated film to win the Oscar. It was a breakthrough film. And so it was Sunday Bloody Sunday about a year and a half later, and I was 
probably the most important gay film to be done, a, a real breakthrough film at that time. You know, it showed gay love and it's a totally natural and loving thing without any remorse or depression or suicide or pills, just love, love. When I was working on Midnight Cowboy uh, in uh, New York, I was uh, worked in a photo studio there and I started f photographing all these great underground movie stars and like Joe D'Alessandro with the hair blowing in Viva and um, Cherry Vanilla. It wasn't quite a gay magazine, but it wasn't that straight, you know? And if your mother found it underneath your bed, you, you wouldn't get in trouble because it had pictures of ballet and ballet and Broadway shows and, you know, Bernadette Peters and Patti Lapone and who all, those are the ones I photographed for After Dark. And everybody in the business saw After Dark, including Andy Warhol, who loved my pictures because I made everyone look really glamorous and beautiful. And he asked me to come work for interview. So I asked Andy, he said, what sort of pictures do you want? And he says, I love beautiful people and I love rich people. And if you, if you can find them beautiful and rich, I'll give you more pages. You know, I just, okay, I'll work on that. I said, are you gonna pay? Oh, that's, that was a bad thing to ask. He looked totally insulted by that. He was very cheap, Andy, very cheap. But that's okay. Everyone in the world saw Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine. It really helped my career a lot. And also got me in the VIP door at Studio 54 once or twice a week. That's a whole other story. I learned more working on that movie in nine months it took to film, seven months, and the editing. Uh, than I did like five years at UCLA, with all due respect to UCLA. If I hadn't gone to UCLA, I don't know if I'd had this extraordinary 52-year career. Um, it's, it was really important to me to be there at that time. The closeted 60s, you know, it was difficult. It, I mean, things were cooking. The, it, it, fashion, the music, rock, LSD, uh, you know, uh, Bob Dylan, the Beatles, it, things were changing quickly then. But it's still, Hollywood was in the closet, really in the closet, that first year. He wanted me to go with him to these great star parties or the premieres and everything. And Hollywood was not out then, you know? And I was pretty young and John was, oh, he was really old. He was 42. <laughs> I was the one who was uptight. Can you imagine that he was very proud of our relationship and he insisted that if we were going to Natalie Wood's A party or Rosalind Russell, who scared the hell out of me, or Betsy Bloomingdale, or Edie Getz, or you know, all these famous people would go to their parties, and, uh, that, that we went together. Most of the famous gay icons, of, that, of course they weren't gay, most of the famous gays who were in Hollywood, Ross Hunter and every, would go out to these grand parties. They always had a beard, a woman with them. They would never take their lover, never, never. So I mean, that's why the magazines later out magazine of Vanity Fair I said John and I were Hollywood's first out couple. I wish marriage equality had come sooner because when John had a, a stroke in 2000 we were we wanted to get married but it wasn't allowed then. We were registered in a West Hollywood office but it wasn't really official you know as a, as a domestic couple. So we were looking forward to it. We knew it was on the cusp. It made my life a lot easier. Fairly catastrophic, uh, that because the lawyers and the bankers and the directors guild said, who are you? I said, well, we've been partners for 37 years, but that doesn't mean anything. You're not legal, you know? You have no rights. It was a nightmare. I had to be on the phone with lawyers and trustees and people for three years, you know, to prove that Huh. I was the, the partner. It was bad enough having him dying of, of, of these strokes. And he died here in Palm Springs in 2003. And I nursed him for three years. And it was hard, it was difficult, but he, it was, you know, it was a wonderful touching thing to share that experience of helping him through this, because he did a lot for me. I'm crying, I'm crying now. Yeah. 
John and I were together 37 years. I mean, so I mean, in a way, we didn't need a piece of paper to prove that. But I think it's a great thing, a great thing. And I love this whole new generation of gays who are, in a way, much more together, much more caring about each other. They're having children. Whatever you think about that, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. And um, you know, it, it's it's very courageous things. It's it's a whole new type of gay life. You know. I became involved with uh, volunteer and charity work in the in the late '80s in uh, in London and uh, in, in in LA where we were living. The AIDS epidemic was just raging, raging, and it affected a lot of a lot of our friends. And I was so moved by that, and it was scared. Uh, and uh, we were there. Uh, I remember going to Cedar Sinai in 1983. And our first two great friends came down with AIDS. And we'd go in the wards there and they'd cover us with all these gowns and rubber gloves and masks and uh, plastic booties. And we weren't allowed to touch our friends who just wanted, they wanted a hug, you know. Friends of mine took me to Marianne Williams and of course some miracles. The question is what can you do today to create a context of people feeling empowered, people feeling loved. She's a wonderful speaker. She said you should need, all need to be involved. You know, action creates reactions. And I thought, what can I do? What can I do? And I went up to her at the end of one of the meetings and I said, well, you know, I, I think what you're doing is great. And she was starting uh, Project Angel Food then. But, but this is no ordinary kitchen. No, 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 no. This is Project Angel Food. I have a really good Rolodex. And I came up with the idea of angel art. Huge success. We thought we were lucky to make $100,000. We made over $500,000 in one night. And it was quite spectacular. And the following year, I came up with the idea of divine design. Marianne thought of the title, which is pretty good. And I produced it, and when I got my friend Bette Midler to come in and perform, and uh, Divine Design is still produced every year, which goes to my show, One Night Only, which I do every year in the desert in Palm Springs. It's a bring in of 24 people from Broadway, and I love Broadway shows. I love these these great singers. And uh, we're on our 16th year here. The show's raised over $2 million for various charities. So proud of that, and I have fun because I love music people. I love working with music.